trust the Lord and do good. Those six words from Psalm 37 form the verse that serves as our verse for the decade of the 2020s. Those six words. And over the next few weeks, your pastors are going to talk to you in detail about those six words. So today, for our time together, I'd like to frame it this way, three sections. I want there to be a time of praise, I want there to be a time of prayer, and then I want there to be a time where we ponder the Word of God and discuss it together. For our time of praise today, I want you to praise God because He is trustworthy and faithful. So many things we could praise God for, but today I want you to zero in on the fact that God is trustworthy and faithful. Psalm 145, the 13th verse, says this, The Lord is trustworthy in all He promises, and faithful in all he does. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. Would you take time in your house church right now to celebrate and praise the fact that the Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. That might mean that you're going to take time and share a scripture that God's placed on your heart about his trustworthiness or his faithfulness. It might mean you share a story about what God's done to show himself faithful and trustworthy in your life. Let's just give him praise this morning in our house churches. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. When you're done with your time of praise, come back and we'll move to the second section, a time of prayer. I'm sure your time of praise was beautiful as you thought about and praise God that he's trustworthy and faithful. Now, trust the Lord and do good. That word trust, it's a verb that has a unique position of being used positively in only two situations. Positively in only two situations. First, of trusting God. And the only other time it's used in a positive situation is in Proverbs 31.11, where it says this, The heart of her husband trusts her, and she will greatly enrich his life. The only other time pray, or trust is used in a positive way is that a way a husband is to trust his wife. There's so much more we could talk about there, but we know that we can trust the Lord. In virtually every, every other case, the verb is used in the negative. In fact, do not trust. Do not trust. One of those is in Psalm 146.3. Psalm 146.3 says this, Do not put your trust in princes, in powerful human beings who cannot save. The psalmist says, don't trust in princes. Who are the princes? Well, the psalmist uses the word princes for officials, maybe actual princes or actual royalty, but it's the people who are in charge. And if that's the case, it's fascinating and it makes me chuckle a little bit because the songwriter who writes this, don't put your trust in princes, he was a prince. <laughs> he was a leader. And it seems counterintuitive. It would be like me saying to you, don't trust the words of any preacher because that puts me in that category. But we get the point right. The leader who writes these words has enough sense to know that he can't be really trusted either. Human beings are just too susceptible to corruption, to power, and to ego. No matter how carefully we try to orchestrate our world, other people, it can always be disrupted. And every election cycle proves the point. From the biblical perspective, God is the only one you can really trust. And the wife, who is so focused on God's purposes that she does your heart good, husband, we all know this, we just choose to forget it. We put our trust in things we think we can handle, things we think we control. Control Insurance, security systems, investments, gated communities, stocks, bonds, political parties, political candidates. Maybe the leader who wrote this knew just how untrustworthy he was. I think that that's the kind of human leader we really need. Someone who clearly knows his or her own faults and says so. Maybe it's why Paul's ministry is so successful. He writes to a younger pastor named Timothy these words, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Paul said, when you look at me, just know I'm a sinner and I'm the worst of them all. So God's word says don't trust in those kind of leaders. But he does tell us we can do something good for them. Trust the Lord and do good. We trust in the Lord and we can do good by praying for the leaders all over the world. It's part of the good we can do. 
Paul writes to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus. He says these words, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. I want us to spend time in prayer as we trust the Lord and do good. The doing good is we can pray. We're something like 23 days from an election in our country. Have you spent more words in prayer for the political candidates or have you spent more words in critique and criticism? I'd like for us to spend some time and do what Paul says. First of all, I urge that prayers and petitions and intercessions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all, lead, of all men, for all people, including those who are running for election. We don't put our trust in them, but we do pray for them. This might be hard. Can I ask you, when we go to our time in prayer, would you be willing to pray for the political candidate you're not voting for? We're to pray for all people. Has your heart become so hard to the other side that you won't even pray? What if we spent more time these next 23 days in prayer for those running nationally and locally than we did in critique. I think it's time that God's people pray. And so I'd like for you to pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray for those that you're not voting for. Pray for all people. It's part of the good that we can do. Spend some time talking in house church about the things and the people specifically you need to be praying for, the people that are on your heart. And when you've done, when you, when you've done, when, when you are done in your time of prayer, come back and we'll ponder God's word together. May God bless you as you are obedient to the scriptures and you pray for all people. As we spend time pondering God's word, I'm going to invite you to read a rather lengthy passage of scripture and you uh, in your house church will pause and you can you can do that. But we're going to spend time your pastors the next few weeks talking about those six words, trust the Lord and do good. Trust the Lord and do good. We're going to delve in them tonight or today. I'm going to spend some time talking about the trust the Lord part. And, uh, and the next time we're together, Pastor Woldridge is going to talk about that some. And then he's also going to focus on what it means to do good. Trust the Lord and do good. What if I were to tell you the sentence for the sermon today is this. Everything you've ever wanted is sitting on the other side of your fear. Everything you've ever wanted is sitting on the other side of your fear. You and I have a choice. Will we live with eyes that see by faith or eyes that see by fear? Faith may not be what you think. It's not a desire or a feeling or a way of pretending that something is something that it's not. Faith is a way of seeing. Faith is a way of looking at life from God's point of view. And so today as we focus in on trusting the Lord, I'd ask that you take time and again you can hit pause and read out loud together in your house church from the book of Numbers chapters 13 and 14. From the book of Numbers chapters 13 and 14 then discuss among yourselves what the Holy Spirit is saying in this passage and then just pray that we would all have ears to hear, to be ready to trust God where he's calling us to trust him, and that we would understand what that might mean. And so would you take time now to read Numbers chapters 13 and 14, and when you're done, you can come back and we'll have our conversation. Did you see it in that passage? Everything the children of God had ever wanted was sitting just on the other side of their fear. And so as it comes to our verse, trust the Lord and do good, we need to see with eyes of trust. We need to see with eyes of faith. But the negative side of that, if we don't see with faith, we, we see with fear. So here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to move through and I'm going to give you an outline for discussion. And I'm going to move fast and I'm going to move through this passage of scripture. And I hope that all of you take notes, but I hope there's at least one person in your house church that will write these, this, this outline down so that we can have discussion together about faith and about fear, about trusting the Lord and whether we choose to obey him or not. So there's not going to be much commentary. So write this outline down. And I just want you to remember that if we want to trust the Lord, it's going to require eyes of faith and a clear vision. Vision. Jesus once said, it's recorded, his words recorded in Matthew chapter 6, he says this, your eyes are the lamp of your body. If your eyes are open and good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your vision is bad, your whole life will be full of darkness. And if the light you think you have is really darkness, it's the worst kind of darkness you can have. And some of us think we're operating in faith when we're really operating in fear. And so as it comes to trusting the Lord, when it comes to not operating and seeing with faith, when we don't have clear vision, very quickly, three things that unclear vision can lead to. First of all, we see it in this passage, it can lead to indecision. It can lead to indecision. We don't know what to do. Will we do it or will we not? If our vision is not clear, we'll be indecisive. James chapter 1 says this, double-minded people can't make up their minds. They waver back and forth in everything they do. Unclear vision, uh, refusing to see with eyes of faith, leads to indecision. Secondly, it leads to division. Some in the group want to go and take the land. Some of the group say no. Proverbs 28 verse 2 says this, when a country is in chaos, everybody has a plan to fix it but it takes a leader of real understanding to straighten things out. And God to put a leader and God to put a vision. But when the vision is not clear, there is division. And the third thing that leads to unclear vision, refusing to operate with eyes of faith, is just what I'm going to call collision. We just start banging heads against one another and against what God really wants for us. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 says this, Some people have refused to let their faith guide their decisions, and their faith has been destroyed like a wrecked ship. Wrecked ship. We need to let faith operate, uh, be, our, be our eyes. We need to operate with eyes of faith and not eyes of fear. And so as you read Numbers chapters 13 and 14, uh, God had sent his people to see the land that he had promised them, the promise that they had been waiting for. And Moses sends 12 spies uh, to view out the land. He, he wants them to look at it and he wants them to come back and report. And so they go away and 10 eyes come back and they saw with eyes of fear and two come back and they saw with eyes of faith and in this instance like in most instances especially when it's a group of people fear has the way of winning out so let's look at seeing our future with faith or with fear and we're called to trust the Lord and do good and today I want to talk about the negative side of trust what happens when we don't trust the Lord what happens when we live by fear not by faith. Moses, uh, Numbers chapter 13 says this, Moses gave these men instructions as he sent them out to explore the new land. Go northward through the Negev and to the hill country and see what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Enter the land boldly and bring back samples of the crops that you see. So they spied out the land all the way from the wilderness up to Hebron. And they saw, look how many times it says what they saw. Are they seen with eyes of faith or eyes of fear? And they saw the Hamanites and the Sheshites and the Talmites and the families descended from Anak. And when they came to Eshcol, they cut down a cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it back on a pole. And they also took samples of the pomegranates and the figs. And after seeing the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel, waiting at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. And they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit from the land, for, for the fruit that they had taken from the land. But the problem is 10 are looking at all of the things they saw and all of the produce they brought back with fear and not with faith. Let me share with you six problems that occur when we see with eyes of fear. Again, I'm going to just list these out. I'm not going to comment. I'm going to give you a scripture reference. I want you to jot them down and I want you to talk about them. When I see, when I refuse to trust the Lord and I see what I'm facing with fear, the first problem is this. I overemphasize the negative in my life. I overemphasize the negative in my life. Numbers chapter 13, it says, This was their report to Moses. We arrived in the land you sent us to see, and it is indeed a magnificent country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is some of its fruit as proof, but 
<laughs> the people living there are powerful and their cities and their towns are fortified and very large. And we also saw the giants of the land who were living there. And we see the negative and we don't focus on the positive. First problem, it causes me to see with eyes that are negative. Second problem, I pay too much attention to what other people are doing. When I see with eyes of fear and not faith, when I don't trust the Lord, I pay too much attention to what others are doing. Numbers 13, 29, the Amalekites live in the Negev and he goes there and he tells you where everybody lives and what they're doing along the way. Instead of focusing on what God wants me to focus on, instead of focusing on what God promises me, I look and I spend too much time focused on what other people are doing. Problem number three, when I see with eyes of fear and not eyes of faith, when I refuse to trust the Lord. Number three, I underestimate the abilities God has given me. I underestimate the abilities that God has given me. Look what they say in Numbers 13, 31. But the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. I'm weak, they're strong. Numbers 13, 32, and 33. The land we explored devours those living in it. The people we saw there are giants. We saw giants there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and they looked the same to us. We see and minimize the things God's put into us. We minimize the abilities. Are you minimizing the abilities God's given to you? That's one way to see if you're looking with eyes of fear, eyes of faith. Number four, when I refuse to trust God, when I focus with eyes of fear, not eyes of faith, I infect others with my negativity. Uh-oh. Watch out. I infect others with my negativity. Numbers 13, 32. They spread a bad, bad report about the land they had explored. Well, this is what I saw. And your negativity spreads like wildfire. When I see with eyes of fear, not eyes of faith, I spread negativity throughout the whole, throughout the whole group. Number five. When I see with eyes of fear, not eyes of faith, when I refuse to trust the Lord, I make myself miserable and I get discouraged. Numbers 14, 1 and 2. Then all the people began weeping out loud and they cried all night. And they grumbled and complained in a great chorus against their leaders, Moses and Aaron. We wish we died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they wailed. We make ourselves so discouraged when we see with eyes of fear and not eyes of faith. And then the final thing that happens when I refuse to trust the Lord, when I see life with eyes of fear, not eyes of faith, is this. Ultimately, I blame God. Numbers 14, 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to the land to be killed with swords? We'd be better off going back to Egypt. This is God's fault. We're called to trust the Lord and do good. Trusting the Lord requires seeing with eyes of faith. And everything we've ever wanted, just like the children of Israel, everything we've ever wanted is sitting on the other side of our fear. Will we trust the Lord? Here's the antidote to all of that fear. We need to develop a vision of faith. We need to see with eyes of faith. Numbers 13.30, one of the two spies that went in and came back and saw with eyes of faith says this, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go at once and take possession of the land right now. We can certainly do this. Eyes of faith say, let's go. Faith requires action. The other one that saw with eyes of faith and not fear named Joshua said this, Numbers 14, we saw the land ourselves and it is very good. If we obey the Lord, he will surely give us that land rich with milk and honey, so don't rebel. We have no reason to be afraid of the people who live there. The Lord is on our side and they won't stand a chance against us. Everything you've always wanted individually, as a family, and for us as a church, is sitting on the other side of our fear. That's why the verse for the decade is trust the Lord. Pastor Warward will remind us of this next week and he'll talk about what it means to do good. But right now, the ultimate question is, which camp do you fall into for the things God has promised you? Do you listen to the voice of the 10 who see with fear or are you willing to listen? and see with eyes of faith and move forward because God is on your side. Use this outline, have a discussion, be honest with one another, be honest about things in your home and maybe even after you leave house, your house church, start talking with your spouse and with your children about where it is you need 
to move in faith where you need to make this verse for the decade a reality in your heart, in your home, and it can become a reality in our valley. Father God, you've given us a choice. May we see with eyes of faith and may we trust you. Father, for those places where we are in fear, we know that's not from you. May we see the negativity that it brings into our lives. And today, may we put an end to that fear simply by trusting you. Father, through your spirit, as you move in house churches, as you move in hearts, may we be obedient and act in faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.